because you're jumping back into the gap. I let the coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Today we have Harvard assistant coach Mike Sotsky with us. And coach, we've had a chance to get to know each other a little bit. And I know previously you were at Duke as well, and we have some co- friends in common. But uh, we had some great conversations last year, particularly at coaching you, prior to coaching you. And I was just excited to have you on to dive deeper and uh, to be able to share our conversation with the audience. So welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me. You mentioned it, but we met at coaching you. You did a terrific job with your talk. And obviously that kind of that was the start of our relationship, and it's really an honor to be on today. You've had some amazing guests and, and do a terrific job with the podcast, so you know, really an honor for me, and look forward to uh, our conversation. Well, thank you, and uh, you know, you're doing a tremendous job, and uh, certainly with Harvard and all this stuff, the rise of Harvard basketball, and all the things that uh, Coach Amaker has uh, started there with you and the rest of the staff. It's just been tremendous to watch, and uh, I know you're one of those must-watch teams now, and we're excited to dive deep. And I think the topic today is absolutely perfect because we're in this era where we have just too much information. And I can't imagine being a young coach nowadays. When I was a young coach, I used to have to go to the library and research and find old books and look at basketball. And there's one game on a week. And now we have YouTube and Twitter and all these other things. And can you talk about being a coach in this era of basketball and all the learning that exists? Well, it's a great point. And it's something that I think a lot of young coaches do struggle with. You know, we constantly want to do more. And it comes from a great place, you know, of wanting to develop yourself personally and professionally, but, you know, invest more time and give more resources, more ideas, learn more concepts. But I do think it's important to be authentic and to stay true to who you are. And so we have all the information at our fingertips, which is great. And there are some amazing resources, basketball immersion being one that I use daily. But, you know, I also think that you can get lost kind of in the sea of information that's out there. And the reality is your own personal experiences uh, growing up long before you even aspire to be a coach and your own value system that you get from your family and from the people that you're closest with, whether in the coaching profession or friends, I think that type of stuff is always going to be more important than what you're going to read online or on Twitter or on Instagram. And so those are great resources. I use all of them. But I do think that to your point, there's such a flood of information now that you can almost get lost in it. And and I'd encourage people to stay authentic uh, to who they are and what they believe in, because that'll always be most important. Such a tremendous message. And to be authentic, be yourself, all those things are are certainly a part of, I think, all the best coaches in terms of their leadership style and and, and that. And uh, can you talk a little bit just prior to getting, we're going to dive deeper into this about how to actually be simple because people that have listened to this podcast know that I'm obsessed with practical. So just saying that is one thing, but doing it is another. So we're going to talk about practical, but just before we do that, let's talk about, you know, one of your role models in this and that's coach Amaker, because you've talked about his influence in talking about less is more. Yeah. Well, and he's uh, an amazing mentor for me and and somebody that that I've really, uh, I consider myself very fortunate uh, to be able to work with him on a daily basis. And he really cares deeply about us as people and not just as, you know, staff members or in the case of our players, as players. And one of the, the components of that for me as a young coach is, you know, he's really coached me and not just, you know, I only coach our players or, or anything like that. And so I've learned a lot from him. And one of the, probably the best lesson I would say that I've taken away in my first three years, and it connects to what we were just talking about of always wanting to do more. You know, he says all the time, and I probably hear it more than anyone, you know, less is more. And, you know, what he really is saying there, and it it shows up in a lot of areas of the program is keeping things simple, you know, distill things down kind of to the essence. And I think that's a really important thing because during the season and and we can cover, you know, I, you know, whether it's scouting offense, practice design, like you can get lost and want to do more or and change things. And the reality of it is sometimes less is more and knowing when to decelerate is, is, more important than accelerate. And he's been, you know, a great mentor and and, uh, I'm really proud uh, to be able to represent his program. Well, and again, in this era, these are great lessons for you as a, 
aspiring head coach. And just to understand again, that you can't do it all, you know, it goes back to a, a Don Meyer quote long time ago, which is when you add, you must subtract. And I've always taken that to heart. Right. That's just been something really important is that keep in mind, if we're going to add something, we should probably think about, and it's not even just necessarily consciously subtracting it, but you know, you're not going to tell your players, say, hey, we're just not going to run this play anymore but we're just not going to run this play anymore. And they won't know that, but we're just not going right. to run this play, but we're going to run this play, for example. So something like that in terms of uh, these things. Coach, let's jump into yeah, scouting. Sorry, go ahead first. No, I, w- I was just going to say, it's a, I love that point. And it's just, you know, it's kind of the economics of time, right? I mean, it's no different than an opportunity cost. If you're going to focus on X, then you are definitely taking your focus away from something else. And so I love the way that, that you put that. Thanks. And, you know, this is something true to me as scouting. Like I just find, again, we spend so much time on scouting as a staff. And I just wonder for the benefit of players, because really ultimately what it comes back to me is what transfers to the game, what actually helps your players perform better. So scouting is one of those topics that I think is a certain amount. It's something we do almost to justify our jobs as coaches. Like we do this mass amount of scouting. But what do we actually disseminate to our athletes and different things like that? So let's talk about simplifying scouting. What do we mean in terms of that and practically simplifying it? Well, yeah, it's a great point. And, and again, it, it comes back to the doing more thing, but less can be more. Coach Amaker talks all the time about keeping the main thing the main thing, which is how are we going to be at our best? In other words, keep the focus on us, what we do, and not become overly consumed with the opponent and what they do. And so obviously... You know, I think the Patriots expression is knowledge is quickness. And so, you know, you want to give your players information so that it can help them during the game. But if you, you know, give them too much information, it can slow them down. And then, you know, your point about scouting to justify what we do. I mean, I find myself, I think, doing that all the time, you know, like as I prepare film for opponents and we split up scouting evenly on our staff, like don't show 90 minutes of film on an opponent because your guys don't have the attention span for it and they're probably not going to get, you know, anything out of it. And so I think especially in today's generation and, and, you know, by no means is this right for everyone, but just what I've come to find and what I think makes sense personally and, and for our program and our staff, you know, shorter is better. And what are kind of the essential pieces that your players need to know and, and that they can act on during the game, translate to use your word and keep to that you know, in your walkthrough, if you walk through 50 plays, then it's unlikely that your guys are going to remember all of them. But, you know, something that we've done is walk through one of the plays and and really take pride in, we are not going to give this look up. You know, this is, we're kind of drawing a line in the sand on, this is a play they've had success with or an action. And, you know, we're not going to give them that. Um, And then the last, you know, one that just comes to mind is, is, is personnel, you know, I think, you know, you want to give, again, pieces to, to help your players out. But if you're spending, you know, 15 minutes on, on their 12th man, then again, to your point, if you add, you have to subtract, you know, now for your players, they're probably not remembering the, the more essential points on, on their, you know, second or third man. And so uh, I think scouting is, a, is an area where you see this a lot. And, and for me, where the less is more message has been really helpful in my development as a coach. Well, it's one of my favorite thoughts is always in my mind when I'm preparing a personnel scout. And it's like, wait a minute, if I, if I put this dude on the scout report, we're probably up big or we're down big. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. it's like, why am I putting this guy on? Like, I know we have this, right. we got to be overly prepared. But then I constantly come yes. back to that and say, and you said opportunity cost, time cost of doing this extra stuff sometimes and going, is there more benefit to me focusing on my team than on the opponent? And uh, Mm -hmm. I know you talk about that as well. Yeah. And and at Harvard specifically, we definitely do that. And and for us, you know, we don't feel like we need to walk through a ton of plays primarily because we're really big on developing our habits, particularly on the defensive end where, you know, our guys know how we defend staggers. Our guys know, how we defend side pick and roll. And of course there's rare exceptions where you have to tweak it, you know, based on your opponent or your own personnel from year to year. But, you know, by and large, we drill those habits consistently throughout the year so that when we're in February and we're seeing split action for the first time in three months, you know, 
our guys know exactly what our rules are in that situation. And so it's not, Hey, you remember this, that no, like we practice that all the time. And so that's again, a focus on, on your own team, your own personnel, your own preparation rather than too much on the opponent. Can you talk about showing short films of your guys playing well? Because I think, again, this is sometimes gets lost in this process is that we focus so much on the opponent that we don't do enough to build up our own players or our own team, especially doing video and uh, self scouts, let's call it. Yeah, no, that's, I think, one of the best things that I've learned since being here. You know, we show our players playing well all the time, in other words, to them. And so, you know, showing that, and, and I think it, it enhances their confidence. And it also is a reminder, you know, say offensively, you can talk until you're blue in the face and emphasize about ball reversals and player movement and ball movement. But it, you know how it is. Guys like to see themselves doing it and then trust it more as a result. And so we show a ton of what we call positive feedback, which is you know just video of our guys basically doing the concepts that we're teaching well. And it reinforces that basically what we're trying to teach as a staff works and that they are capable of doing it. It should give them the confidence to know that they have done it, they can do it, uh, and, and to not get away. Sometimes you get so concerned with what you can't do uh, that you're not as good at what you can do. And just reminding them we have done and you can do these things. Well, it's important reminders, again, just the, this reality that as coaches, we're really good at telling people what they do wrong. And the really right. good ones are <laughs> right. good at telling you what you're doing right as well. And yeah. I'm not saying there's not a place for correction. There certainly is a big place for correction, but we've also got to tell them what they're doing right. And when I think about the ideal coach to play for, it's someone that's going to help me improve which involves correction and me being, being open to that correction, but then also someone who's going to notice my success and notice my progress. And I think that's, again, just, just a great point what you're talking about there. And I think it's become, if anything, more important with this generation, you know, of kind of shouting praise and, and whispering criticism, uh, so to speak. And Coach K was amazing at that. Uh, Coach Amaker is amazing at that um, in terms of really trying to build guys up in their confidence and then finding the right way to teach. And I, I don't, you know, love the word critique, but uh, to kind of coach um, and, and get the, those lessons across that you're talking about, but, but absolutely keeping the focus on building guys up and their confidence and, and their skill sets. Well, it's funny you bring up that word because critical critique, inherently it's not a negative word. It's just that our society, and particularly in sports, we've added this negative connotation to it that really, again, the word in and of itself is of value. But the problem is how we interpret criticism as being always negative. But you can be critical and be positive at the same time. And uh, I got to think that that's something that's reflected in the, the mentors you've had and certainly in your personality as well, that, that your players understand you're coming from a place of uh, just a desire to help them. How does that get conveyed in what you do and certainly with what Coach K and Coach Amaker do? Well, and I've been around, again, I'm, I'm biased, uh, but I've been around, I think, two of the best you know, in our game. And with both of them, it starts with relationships. Uh, you know, Both of those coaches really form close relationships. There's trust there with the players, staff, every you know, member of the program. They're investing their time and getting to know about the players, you know, off the court, what their family lives are like, you know, uh, what their college experience is like, how they can help, you know. Uh, and so to me, and you read about that, I think, you know, at the pro level uh, with Coach Popovich uh, a ton, there have been articles about that most recently, the ESPN one, which uh, was terrific about, you know, kind of the, the meals that they have as, as a team when they travel. And I think, you know, those two coaches that I've, that I've had the honor to work for, do an amazing job with that uh, of, of forming relationships with players. And uh, once you build up that trust and you show that you care uh, players will absolutely, you know, fight for you and, and do whatever they can to, to improve and get better. Well, it, again, just such an important part, as you said, of, I think all generations, but certainly this one, it seems to be more, more evident just because of the choices and the availability that players have to other people in, in terms of influence and all the different things that exist. So this is great. Yeah. The one thing I said too, is that like you gave an example of like saying, we're not giving up this, we're not giving up this. And 
as as a coach, our big thing that said we're never going to give up pick to picker on inbound. Like there was something just as simple right. as that, just saying as personal pride in my 14 years, guys, we've never given up pick the picker. And it just gives them a right. focus point, right? Of saying, hey, listen, we really value not giving up anything on baseline inbound, on sideline inbound. And that was kind of our thing. Is there a your thing when you talk about we're not giving up this at Harvard? Well, it's funny. You, you said you kind of were about to stumble into it. Uh, the first one that comes to mind for me is backside layups on baseline inbound. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a religious devotion uh, to taking that away. I'd have to think it, it for us. I was using that more in the context of scouting, you know, kind of specific actions for a team. But without question, that would be one of them. And then the other one that for us, this isn't a specific action, but you know, we'll never miss a chance to take a charge because it's the ultimate unselfish play. Like people talk about being unselfish all the time on the offensive end. One of the things Coach Amaker talks about constantly is being unselfish on the defensive end. Like being in an active, alert, ready stance on the help side is being unselfish on the defensive end. And then conversely, and the guys don't like when you do this, if you're just standing there and not engaged and not talking, it's selfish. And I don't know that players always like that that makes sense to them when you first say it, but that's the reality of it. And so for us in our program, we are really committed to sacrifice in general. And, and there's no you know, better play to represent that than taking a charge on the defensive end. Well, it's great. A great example of, again, something your program values and what goes into that. And, and it leads to a little bit into our next thing, which is analytics. Again, I did not have the benefit or maybe not the benefit <laughs> of having all these analytics. And, and really, again, I, I should have paid more attention in calculus. But man, <laughs> how as a coach now are you dealing with this massive amount of data to be able to decipher and figure out what actually matters? Yeah, it's a great question. An expression that I love is that which gets measured gets managed or kind of the you know same thing, measure what matters. But if you're measuring a thousand things, then none of them matter. It's very similar kind of the point I was making with scouting. And so, you know, to me, what are the kind of two to three max things on the offensive or defensive end that are going to make you successful and then be really fanatical about measuring those things, making your players aware that those things matter and be kind of maniacal in, in emphasizing them. And so for us, we have a system of, you know, our players could go right down the list of, of the things that matter to us. Just to give you one, we count what we call quick OBs. In other words, you know, we want to play fast. And so inevitably we're going to get scored on, but we want to get the ball right out of the net, uh, get it in and, and push it with pace up the floor. And so that that's one. And, and our guys know that. And that's a huge point of emphasis for us. We were as getting back to the point of being unselfish. We try to be a very unselfish team. And so we chart making the extra pass. Uh, and if guys fail to do that, that's unacceptable. And so, you know, those are two, you know, for us on the offensive end that really matter. And then the other thing I would say is try to find the things that, you know, kind of have downstream consequences, if you will. So for example, you know, it makes sense to me and we do this to really emphasize transition defense, because if you're emphasizing transition defense, like you can't be a good transition defense team if you're turning the ball over constantly and you're taking bad shots, it's just not possible. And so by emphasizing transition defense, you're really checking off two pretty important boxes on the offensive end as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's great. And coach, I, can, can you define a little bit? Like how, how do you define quick OBs? Is it a time? Is it, like, what, how yeah. are you defining that? Yeah. So, so the ball shouldn't bounce ideally if it does definitely not more than once. And we want to clear the lane and we want to get it in and basically get it across half court as quickly as possible. And so we've done at times where we'll literally time it and we'll give them, you know, four seconds or five seconds to get the ball across half court. But we are, we really emphasize in terms of the actual quick OB, getting the ball out of the net if we can, uh, if for whatever reason you can't, then getting it off one bounce. We're not just going to let it lay and we're going to inbound, clear the lane with pace, inbound and get the ball over half court. Oh, that's great. And what all this comes in, this is 
an aside a little bit, but what it comes back to, because you use the word consequences and we've used the word correction. So what it comes back to a little bit is how are we handling interventions? What are consequences in Harvard basketball or Duke basketball or in your mind? How are we handling those things? Because again, there's this tendency for us to be reactionary as coaches. And to a certain extent, we need to be because we want to correct people. But there's obviously an art to this plus the science. So how are you handling correction and consequences? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think one of the the things that's really interesting is I think that depending on where you are and the type of players and kids that you have, you have to take different approaches. Like it's not, it's never been uh, and never will be a one size fits all in terms of corrections and consequences. And so I think that at the root of it is how do your guys learn best? And for us, we found that the screaming and yelling thing, not that that's, you know, our personality uh, as a staff anyway, but that just doesn't work for our guys. And so are you doing that so that you feel better? Or are you doing that because you genuinely believe that's the best way to teach? And so for us, what we've found is the film has been terrific because we can then show, look, this is, this is what we're seeing. You know, maybe it didn't feel like that at the time in terms of, you know, your lack of pace and energy, but this is what it looks like to us as we're watching and, and educating, keeping the focus on teaching and educating and being positive with our guys. Now, does that mean at times to get back to your other question about we're not, you know, you said giving up screen the screener. Like if we give up a backside layup, we're not going to take the time to be nice and educate. <laughs> you know, that's just something our guys know that, and we've talked about it, drilled it, taught it too many times for it to be acceptable to let that happen. But, you know, so that's that constant balance of on the spot correction and, and, you know, kind of snapping guys into shape. But I'd say that's far more rare for us than teaching, educating, and kind of praising positive action. Right. And, uh, and again, that comes back to a little bit of, of what you've already talked about already is that uh, what's important, you know, is our players know what you want to call them non-negotiables or what we measure, whatever those things are. It's not like these are out of the blue. Your players hear about these things every day, right? So, right. and that's what you're saying, but uh, it's, it's really good stuff. And I think another area where I think we can get lost as coaches and, and, and I'm probably part of this problem. So uh, I'm saying this with full knowledge of that is that like practice design, there's just so many drills or so many things. And, and I hope I'm part of the solution as well as part of the problem in stimulating people's thinking about saying, Hey, just remove the fluff and get to the point, you know, instead of doing all mm-hmm. these drills. But let's talk about this massive information that goes into practice design. And, and again, there's this, this obsession, which I was a young coach. I spent all this time on practice. It was my favorite time of day. It would take me hours to plan a practice. And now, honestly, like I know I'm not supposed to say this, I can literally plan a practice in five minutes because of how we practice and my experience. Right. But literally, we're going to go in and right. we're going to play basketball in practice. It's just what we're going to emphasize within the different phases. But can you talk a little bit about practice design and dealing with that? Well, it gets back to kind of the heart of, of this, you know, the theme of this whole conversation is, is keeping things simple. You know, one of my favorite Coach K lines that he used all the time is the game is the best teacher, Uh, kind of what you just described of of just playing and and a lot of, you know, kind of the correction that you feel needs to happen will organically arise. Um, And so, again, are, are you doing drills just to do drills to feel like you're coaching or is that maybe not the best way for your players to receive the information or the best investment of your time? And, you know, you can't prepare for everything. It's not possible. But I think just from my experience here and and, uh, at Duke as a manager, that if you just play, you end up with a lot of the issues that are, you know, uh, need correction uh, from during games. Uh, So I would say, you know, keeping it simple uh, in terms of of the practice design and a lot of the kind of issues will arise organically. And, and one thing I've thought about more recently, and I, I don't know about this yet, this is just something that I've been thinking about this summer, we really pride ourselves on executing in game situations here at Harvard. We work on, you know, 73, 72 with six seconds left, you know, those kinds of all the, you know, game situations that, that people generate. And I, I think it's been very good for us. But I also wonder, if, you know, if you get bogged down and working on so many of those game situations, a lot of the time you'll never see that, you know? And so 
absolutely you want to be prepared, but maybe rather than doing the specific game situation, just go 70 to 70 with six minutes left and let the guys play it out and maybe let them coach themselves. And so they learn what to do. And that's something we have done in terms of letting our guys coach themselves in practice and in game situations. But just just kind of opening it up a little bit more so that it feels more natural and maybe even sticks better for players than, than just going through, you know, kind of a quote unquote random up three, six seconds left type situation. Well, one thought to add to that, and, and you guys probably do this, but like so, too often we think about special situations or game situations, as you said, which I like that term better, as just being end game. But these can be start yeah. a game. These can be, you know, going into the quarter, the half, uh, two for one situations, all these different things that you're you're creating. And as I said, I love the fact that what you guys do is you allow the situation to evolve organically, so to speak, in the sense that you create the score and then whatever happens, happens. But that could be opening tip. That could be out of timeout, you know, all these different game situations. So the coaches too often, I think, just think about them as end game. So that's great. And I assume yeah. you guys work on opening tip as much as you'd work on end game, I would think, in terms of these situations. We do. And again, you'd be amazed uh, at some of the stuff that, that can come up from closing a half. You know, I mean, we show, and, and again, this gets back to the film, we show a lot of situations. Uh, Coach Amaker has an expression, learn from the mistakes of others because you're not going to have enough time to make all of them yourself. And so we'll show games around the country of, you know, for example, being down to needing to miss a free throw to try to get a tip in and the player at the free throw line doesn't know that the ball needs to hit the rim. And so trying to educate without making the quote unquote mistakes ourselves uh, has been really good for us. Uh, and so that's an end of game one, but we've shown end of half when a player doesn't real, you know, doesn't remember that the clock continues to run at the end of the first half. And so we should be quick OB anyway in our system. But sometimes, you know, if a player doesn't know that and he's lethargic and inbounding the ball, the clock is just going to expire. And so definitely to cover, you know, situations throughout the game. No, it's great. It's really good stuff. And then the other part that goes with this is this more of a question then. So what are we doing during these game situations? Are there stops and starts from the coaching staff? I know you said that the players are empowered in some cases to, to make decisions and whatnot. Are we hands off or are sometimes we stopping and starting? Uh, you know, Because again, I, I do feel like there's sometimes a fear we say within practices that, oh, when they're playing, they're playing. And when we're doing drills, we're coaching. But the reality is if you do a lot right. of these situations, you need to intervene as a coach. So what type of things are happening to actually have interventions within these phases? So we try to do a lot of that intervention on the front end. In other words, we cover kind of what we feel are the bare essentials or the things that are commonly going to occur, whether that's up three with 10 seconds left or, you know, kind of the most common situations. And we try to teach those early in our structure of practices. Uh, and then during the season, certainly, we basically just let our players play it out and hope that they, you know, remember what we've taught them. And if they don't, then we just let it go and kind of do a little what we call after action review. Uh, so that can be film or more likely than not, before we even do the film, one of our coaches will just take our team through the exact situation that occurred, how it played out and how it probably should have played out. But yeah, we once we get into the season after we've done the kind of basic situations early, uh, we, we let our guys pretty much play. How much practice or how much uh, video are you showing players of practice? Like in terms of specific individual players, not in terms of team, but are, are you getting this opportunity to be able to show them individual clips of them in practice as well? Absolutely. And we do it more, of course, early before we get into gameplay. Once we get into games, keep the focus more on games. But yeah, we divide up uh, three assistant coaches and you know, uh, kind of split up the perimeter and then one coach takes the post and we, you know, watch clips with our guys after practice or, uh, you know, basically whenever we get the chance um, to, uh, to educate them. Yeah, it's good. And uh, I mean, again, that's the value of film nowadays. And clearly, again, you have a bigger staff than some of the people we're talking about or talking to in terms of this podcast. But, and that's where we come back to all these decisions. It's like, are you going to focus on your team? Are you going to focus on the opponent? And uh, you brought up Popovich. And I think that's always been a good example for coaches is that 
you know, by and large, they focus on themselves and uh, they trust their system. They trust their ability to be able to defend whatever comes their way because you can't possibly be prepared anyways. So, you no, know, I guess, exactly right. I guess, relax, coach. <laughs> relax, <laughs> you play, figure it out. And it's hard. Oh, it's so it's hard. It's hard because it, it, it comes from a good, again, it comes from a good place. And, and a quote that, that I really, I like is, uh, it's an Einstein quote, uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. In other words, like you don't want to kind of simplify so much that you feel like your team is ill prepared, but striking that balance between I've given them too much and my guys aren't ready is, is kind of that, that golden area. And I certainly don't have the answer for that. And I am continuing to learn from a ton of different people on how they do it. But I do like that quote of everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, and I think that's really important. No, I love it. That's really good stuff. And uh, again, it, again it is, in this era, this is probably the most important thing for a young coach, for an assistant coach, especially, you know, because as an assistant, I mean, you're doing the best you can, obviously, to help Harvard, but obviously every assistant, someone is preparing to be a head coach. And, and I don't think there's a, a head coach that wouldn't want that. Like I would, I would dream of having assistants that wanted to be head coaches because I know that they would put you know, so much more time and effort into in development and doing all the right things. So this is another process and maybe again, a little aside, but what are you doing to kind of keep all the best ideas or to, you know, throw out all the worst ideas? How are you managing that, you know, as an aspiring head coach? Hey coach, just a quick interruption from the podcast. I just wanted to let you know, I would love for you to join basketballimmersion.com, of course, to help support all the online sharing I do. But I don't want to interrupt these podcasts for ads anymore. From now on, ads for Basketball Immersion events and products will be at the end of the podcast. I hope you will check them out. For instance, this week I'm sharing information about our BI Training Academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th. Go to www.basketballimmersion.com BI Training to learn more or listen at the end of this podcast for more information. Now let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, that, that's something that I, I feel that I've actually really improved on uh, uh, recently. Uh, you know, I can be a bit disorganized at times. Uh, and so I got my Evernote uh, subscription a few years ago. And basically now I have a series of folders where I just catalog the best ideas or best sets. I mean, it's, you know, uh, probably 10 folders or so where I try to keep everything uh, because I've found, you know, you think you'll never forget that lesson or that motivational speech or that uh, set or that scouting principle, but because of all of the information that you process on a daily basis and, you know, it, because you maybe go to a different school or take a different job, it, it kind of becomes out of sight, out of mind. And so really since uh, arriving at Harvard and I did it uh, as a manager at Duke. It wasn't organized as well. I've since organized it. Uh, I've just tried to really be detailed and, and to not let even the, the basic kind of messages, thoughts, concepts slip away from being recorded because you just never know what you will and won't remember. Um, and uh, it's been very positive for me. For coaches that like taking notes in this era, I cannot recommend, and they're not a sponsor, but I cannot recommend it enough. It's called Rocket Book. Get Rocket Book. If you have, it's getrocketbook.com. But what it does is basically you can write notes if you like still writing by hand instead of typing or something like that. And it actually works with Everlast. Mm -hmm. But basically you you'd scan it and goes right into your, your cloud or whatever you've got going on in terms of that. But it's a really cool concept and it'll help. Uh, I mean, I wish I had this when I was younger because I, I still have all these notebooks. And just as I left Windsor, I'm like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Like, do I just right. export it or whatnot? Right. And I wish at the time it was all digital and everything. Cause as you said, there's so much value to going back and even reflecting. And I also, I don't, I don't know if you do this, but I've encouraged a lot of young coaches to be able to journal and uh, journaling sometimes seems like not the coolest thing in the world, but to be able to journal and reflect after every practice, after every game and, and just keep kind of a list of what you like, what you don't like. And uh, you know, different things like that, that kind of, you can go back and reflect on. And I still go back to some of the journals I kept when I was a, a varsity girls coach. And some of those lessons are 
probably the most important lessons I learned. So really good stuff. I'm glad that uh, you're in that uh, phase of self-reflection and, and self-criticism as well. And the, the quote really that spurred it for me was uh, I went to a rising coaches conference, uh, which that group does a terrific job uh, for young coaches uh, and trying to break into the, the industry and the profession. And it was Coach Cruz. And he said, don't do it by default, do it by design. Uh, and he was just talking about how there's so many different aspects of a program that, again, you know, you just don't even think about. Like one of the ones, and Coach Amaker is amazing with this in terms of his attention to detail. You know, how do you want your players to conduct themselves during the national anthem? Uh, do they shake hands with the opposing coach? Do they shake hands with the referees? How do they stand? How do they? Uh, how do we do the starting five intro? And it all matters. You know, maybe that's not as important as the first play in terms of you know executing whatever action you're going to run, but but it, it, here at least it, it all matters. And so just kind of trying to do it all by design and and not micromanaging, but there's a certain way that, that it's done at first class programs. And we strive to, to kind of be like that here. And so the only way you can do that is to kind of record all of those little details as you go, because otherwise it's just too much and, and you won't be able to remember it. Well, and that's, that's a great point. Something simple, like obviously standing for the anthem or how you're going to do intros, et cetera. And I think the point that you're making there as well is that that doesn't have to be the coach's decision. That can be a group decision, sure, sure. Be surely an empowered decision. But the point is, it's a conscious decision. It's very deliberate. And yes. I love that. I love that phrasing that you use and, uh, to be able to and, get the and in fact, design. And in fact, to, specific to that example, we did ask our players. That's a conversation that we had with our players at the beginning of the year of how do you want to do this? And that's kind of the reason that that one was at the forefront of my mind because we noticed, you know, some opponents come over and shake Coach Amaker's hand, some don't. And so it's not something we've ever done, not because we're poor sports, but uh, it's just not, you know, something we've had in the design. But we did run it by our players, and now we kind of have a policy for it. So many great plays out there, obviously, and I think coaches are getting even more creative with stuff. And, you know, uh, we can talk about stealing and we can talk about all that other stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of coaches that just take a certain sequence and add it to the same play that we used to run or a little, little, little change, a little counter, whatever it is. But the point is, there's an overwhelming amount of really good plays that work, but they don't work all the time. So how as a coach are we going to manage this offensive database and, as we said, get to the simpler version of coaching when we have all these plays that work online? Because, again, mostly we don't post plays that don't work online. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be a good idea if you did, I guess. Well, um, maybe I should start it, doing it, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> It could be like the, I think uh, Damian Lillard maybe did that uh, with like the fake player development video. So that could yeah, be your own yeah. satire. You could post ridiculous plays where uh, your center never crosses half court for sp purposes of spacing. Um, oh. But um, no, I, I think it, it's a little cliche, but you know, we try to keep the focus on, at least on the offensive end on, you know, teaching our guys how to play uh, more than teaching specific plays. And so, you know, if your guys can, can get good at making uh, reads that commonly occur during the game in whatever offense you're running, then maybe you don't need seven plays that lead to a side ball screen. Maybe if you have two actions uh, that get you there uh, and your players are then all really good at reading uh, that exact situation with that floor spacing, with that personnel, that that will take you further than, to your point, a, a great counter. Um, and it's, it's a delicate balance where, again, you feel like you have a chance to help your team because you saw this action and it led to a backdoor layup for the Warriors. And so you want to put it in and, and maybe you should. Uh, but then if you give your guys too much, then maybe they won't ever get as good at executing each individual action. You'll be a, a, a B minus across the board at running your 70 plays instead of being an A at running your seven. and that's hard. Again, I'm just kind of speculating like you of what's best. I'm not sure. And, and I've never been a head coach, but it's something that I've thought a lot more about recently. Well, it, it, again, I mean, sometimes when we say, oh, we, you know, that, that cliche that you said, we were going to let them play. Well, coaches imply that that means you're not going to have structure, but that's not what you're saying at all. Like you can still be very structured and let your players play. It's, it all comes right. down to that those unstructured moments within every play is 
do they have the freedom to, you know, penetration reaction, post reaction, second cut reaction, or offensive rebounding reaction? Do they have all this freedom to be able to, again, attack the matchup when they see it, whatever it may be? And that can all happen within sets. Because I think that's misconstrued about what I say, too, is that I'm not a coach that just rolls up the ball and lets our guys run whatever motion is. Like, we have very much sure. structure, but within that structure, they have freedom. And I think that's a part of what you're what you're saying is that within what you do, your players have this ability to be able to, to make decisions. That's a great point. Uh, and and I, I think the freedom thing is is really important, but but within kind of a structure is is how we've tried to look at it. If we're gonna provide a, a basic structure offensively and kind of you know some points of emphasis, as I mentioned before, we really pride ourselves on sprinting to offense, playing with pace and then being a very unselfish team offensively. And so, you know, those two things, before we even talk about X's and O's, those are musts for us. And that's part, you know, kind of of our identity as a team. And so no matter who's on the floor, we're going to do that, meaning sprinting to offense and being unselfish. But within, you know, that kind of overarching, you know, philosophy, you have to develop a system that makes sense uh, for your team and, and your players. And that can look like a lot of different things. But to your point, you know, by saying I'm going to give them freedom, that doesn't mean that we're just rolling the balls out. Uh, there's a philosophy, there's a system, and and then guys can, you know, use their talents to make plays. So what's an actionable strategy for a coach that's struggling to keep it simple? Is there something that you would suggest or something that you've learned through your time with uh, Coach Amaker or Coach Krzyzewski? It's a great question. I would say that the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, I would, to use, I think it's a Pat Riley quote, but uh, keep the main thing, the main thing. And so, you know, I would try to really think critically about, okay, what is your philosophy? What do you believe in? How do you want to play? Uh, And start there. And so, you know, whatever that is, that probably shouldn't change all that much. But within your system, then pick the, let's say, and again, this is, uh, I'm just speculating for the first time, but uh, in terms of, you know, this question, pick, let's say the three things that you, the three looks, let's say, that you really think are good for your offense. And so let's pretend it's Jimmy with an elbow catch, Tommy in a spread pick and roll, and, you know, uh, Albert with a post touch or, you know, whatever those three things are, and then kind of look at what sets or you know, within your motion offense, what principles or however you play get you to that and build backwards. And so get to those looks with kind of whatever you're doing and maybe eliminate some of the other stuff that it could be near and dear to your heart. But if it's not getting you to kind of where your team is at its best offensively, then maybe you don't need it. So it's not something I've thought a ton about, but certainly I think we kind of organically do that uh, at Harvard with, with how we structure things and what we emphasize. So let's shift it to defense then. I mean, we can talk about something as simple as a ball screen. Again, there's an overwhelming amount of choices for ball screen. How much should we change a game by game basis for an opponent or how much should we stick to our, our core ball screen principle? And, and I think it's safe to say nowadays, it's certainly at your level that you can't probably have just one ball screen coverage. You need to have an A, B, and C, which I think is what Brett sure. Stevens calls it. But let's focus on how much are we changing? How much variability is there within ball screen coverage? And again, in keeping in mind, what are we doing to keep it simple for our players? Yeah, it's again, it's kind of like, uh, I feel like a lot of these examples, it's like the Goldilocks thing of, of trying to find that middle ground where you don't want to have you know 10 ball screen coverages and you're a B minus at all of them. Um, because then you're probably not maximizing uh, your potential on the defensive end. But to your point, uh, teams are so good offensively now and and with the ability uh, of guys to shoot it, you probably do need to have, uh, you know, several looks. And so uh, I think that, you know, it's important to have a base coverage, uh, whatever that is for you. And uh, at our level, that's increasingly uh, with a lot of teams kind of switching uh, one through four, uh, and then, you know, if, if teams can switch one through five, then, then maybe to do that. Uh, but whatever your base coverage is, so say, you know, we're going to hedge everything, try to get really good at that, uh, try to become an A at that, so to speak. Uh, and then when you do, you know, have the opportunity, you know, work on some of those other coverages that you think you might need down the line. And, and to me, and Coach Amaker talks about this a lot, 
I think it's really important to work on them uh, defensively so that you get better at attacking them offensively. If your guys are only going against, you're a hedge team, and your guys are only going against hedging in practice for the entire preseason, then when you play your first game and a team is icing it on the side, they're not going to be ready for that. And so you try to kind of, you know, we don't have enough time to do things one at a time. And so focus on maximizing it on both the offensive and defensive ends. But I would say having a base coverage, uh, switching can be really effective uh, if you have the personnel to do it. Uh, But then also knowing that you're probably going to have to at some point deviate uh, and adjust. Yeah, no, that whole question about are we going to do other things that our opponents potentially are going to do? And again, the way that you've talked about a little bit of how you practice, it's easier to do because there's flexibility within these game situations to be able to say, hey, listen, you know, pull a team aside and say, listen, we're going to trap this ball screen. Like we've never trapped in practice or we've never trapped in a game and we're never going to, but it's not that hard to figure out. And it's not that hard to create that initial point of pressure, which is really all you're trying to create. And it doesn't change. I mean, if we said no fouling in practice, it doesn't mean our players are going to foul in the game. Like, again, like we've got to assume that there's some common sense and your players are smart enough to understand the difference because you're going to explain it. And I'm assuming, again, those situations arise all the time in preparation for unique opponents. And uh, I can't picture an I and I think right now that's unique. But, you know, say you had played West Virginia, <laughs> right? West Virginia is completely different. So you got to do some right. therapy. And I think what you just said in terms of the way you presented it uh, is really important. And that's kind of what we do with our guys. Like, you know, you just mentioned Ivy League. You know, we have really bright kids on our team uh, at Harvard. And, you know, they can really be thinkers. Obviously, we, you know, in terms of their studies academically, but then also as basketball players. And so, again, simplifying, like the way you just presented it to me of, of you guys never blitz, but like, that's not something we've done a ton, but when we present that in practice, we present it in a very, I don't want to say casual way, but like, let's not overthink this, you know? So if that's something we're working on, it's okay, you two go trap the ball screen and then let's figure it out from there. And you don't need to get bogged down in the minutia of who's going to be the first rotation because again, it'll probably just come up organically. And if it's not your main coverage, then you probably shouldn't get bogged down in trying to become the best at it because then you're just taking time away uh, from everything else. So does that make sense in terms of like how we'll present it to our team? Yeah, no, it's great. And uh, again, I, it's it, the main thing for me is, again, your players understand. They understand what you're doing. They understand how you're approaching it and they understand why you're approaching it, right? And all those things translate and uh, it's great. I, I really like it. And Jumping, I guess, to player development then, because here's another area where if you're on Instagram in particular, like you're just, (laughs) what is player development? Like, I don't even know what it is anymore based on what I see. Again, I have, I have, I come into this conversation with some biases, but, but I also don't think it's what we traditionally thought player development is because I think, again, the way we teach and pedagogy and, you know, not what we teach, but how we teach should, should be changing how we approach player development. But what does this mean for you now in terms of simplicity, player development? What are we talking about? Well, the first thing I would say, just uh, to clarify, you know, for us at Harvard, and I think in the best programs, player development goes, is a lot broader than skill development. I think those are two different things. And so, and I, we've, you and I have talked about this, educating guys on their diet and on sleep and on, you know, hydration, nutrient, all those things, like, that's part of player development and, and at the best programs, you know, certainly at the professional level where they have all of the resources to do that, uh, that's become increasingly important. Uh, mental health is part of player development. You know, what system do you have in place uh, for guys to, uh, you know, get help or talk to people beyond just, you know, their teammates or coaches, like all of that is part of player development. Uh, so just to, you know, kind of, you know, make that distinction. But, you know, to your question specifically, I think you're more referring to kind of skill development. Well, um, I, I, no, coach, I love your point there because what I have a hard time with is the fact that player development is its own special thing. And that's what you're saying. Like our, every practice, when we're playing five on five, that's player development. Like, I don't think, I, I don't know, we separate right. it too much. We isolate it too much. 
And again, I think shooting can be isolated, but by and large, most th other things in basketball, it's really hard to isolate, right? Because they're combined mm. with other things. They're combined with decisions. They're combined with other actions. So I totally am on board with what you're saying, whether it's a holistic approach beyond just basketball or it's beyond just, again, we're not talking about an isolated skill training. Player development is so much more. And really good programs are developing players in everything you do. Then that's definitely the, you know, the approach that we've taken. Uh, and, and we try specific to Harvard not to get off track to kind of utilize the resources that we're very fortunate to have here on campus. Uh, and so player development for us goes beyond even things that quote unquote directly translate to their game. You know, we, we uh, do a ton of events and, and off the court programming with our guys that we feel make them better young men. You know, we have events at the Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics and uh, take them to plays in the community and bring in guest speakers. And so all of that stuff is really important to us, the holistic approach as, as you're describing. But, you know, just to anyway, just wanted to kind of make that distinction. But that's been one of the, the great things for me to be a part of that and, and to help set those things up. But to get back to kind of, I guess, the basketball side and the skill development part, you know, I'm sure you see this and, and certainly we do too, of there's, there's a fine line between, you know, guys expanding their skill set, trying new things, whatever, you know, move or kind of concept is in vogue, but are guys trying to kind of run before they learn to walk, so to speak? You know, are they uh, going, you know, combo move, step back before one dribble pull up? And I think in some respects, you know, you want to give guys the freedom and the you know confidence to work on their game and to try new things and, and get, you know, develop new skills. But at the same time, there are certain skills that sometimes then just get overlooked because they're not as popular or they're not as fashionable right now. But you probably should be working on A before B is at least something that we have found uh, as a staff. And then, and I don't have it in front of me, but to me, and this gets maybe back to the player development more than skill development thing, one of my favorite quotes, it's a Jeff Van Gundy quote uh, from a while ago, and maybe you've seen this, but it's, you know, it basically is talking about how players nowadays really like the skill development piece, but I don't know how much they love the competition was Coach Van Gundy's point. So I don't know if you've seen that quote, but it's a great quote. And, and he kind of goes on a little bit more, but he's making the point that at the college level that it, are you an ass kicking, I think is his actual phrase, kind of competitor, because that's going to go a lot further than your step back. And it's not wrong uh, for you to be really skilled and good with the ball and to have multiple moves in your package. That's great. But if you don't know how to utilize it in five on five play, when you're going against competitors, it, it won't do you much good. Well, it's a great quote. And I'm not a big fan of generalizing from generation to generation because, you know, again, I mean, there's competitive people in this generation, competitive people in the last generation. And non-competitive people in both generations too. But the main thing is that skill, Absolutely. in my mind, always equals confidence. Skill equals confidence. The more skilled you are, the more things that you can do that equals confidence. But then it's a coach's job to define how those skills happen within the team setting and what's best for the team. Because as you said, like even if they have the ability to shoot the step back, that might not be the best shot for the team. And, and we know based on analytics, it's probably not for most players. So, you know, those things are defined by the coach. And uh, that's part of what your skill development stuff does, I'm assuming, is that it defines the role for the player, too. Is, look, I know we can do this. The offseason maybe is a time for dreaming, for developing this other skill. But in season, I mean, we got to focus on skills that are actually going to happen in the game. And yeah, that's again, exactly that's, right. When, you know, and on. a big part of that, too, is that that's where it gets back to trust a little bit, you know, of like when we're telling guys, listen, if you want to play, you need to defend and rebound. Let's just pretend that's kind of the message that we're giving a player. They, they need to trust you uh, that, that that's true and not that, well, he's just saying that, but really, if I can score and hit open threes, then that's really what he wants. Because if, if that trust isn't there or that belief isn't there, that, then it, it's never going to work anyway uh, in terms of defining roles and and we say all the time, not accepting roles, but embracing roles. Uh, the best teams have players that embrace roles. Are, are you guys still doing guard post breakdown? Is that still a thing? Or is it more positionless we in do. terms of your workouts? Okay. 
Well, well, both. Uh, you know, we have uh, guys who, you know, especially in today's day and age, are increasingly versatile, and so we will still do kind of some guard specific stuff and some post specific stuff. Uh, but we do probably, I'd say, more uh, positionless team play, playing together, and kind of the you know, say, universal skills that you need to have, whether you're a five or a one. No, it's good. It's it's good just to frame it a little bit for people because I've actually had some um, some coaches reach out to me asking me about people that do a really good job with uh, post development nowadays, and I, yeah. there's lots of people. There's lots of people that do it. It just doesn't seem to be as popularized. It's almost like it's a hidden part <laughs> of things because you're yeah, it's, find out that it's it's not not what we should be doing. But as you know, at a lot of levels, I mean, it's not the NBA. So what you should be doing might not be completely the same as what the NBA would say. Well, you'll laugh at this. We, we just had our camp uh, the other day, and I kind of knew I was setting myself up for, for disaster here, but I couldn't help myself uh, to do it anyway. I asked, and I was smart enough to not divide it by certain metrics, but I said, let's just get, I had a group of about 50 in a gym, and I said, let's just get our point guards and combo guards here, our wings here, and our post players here. What do you think the breakdown was uh, when I did that of the 50 players? Because I didn't count. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, was, it was 35, 15, zero. There, there were <laughs> zero post players, uh, despite the fact that two of the guys were 6'9". And I'm not saying <laughs> that they're wrong. You know, There are obviously guys who are seven feet who are playing on the wing. But the point is that the post development thing gets overlooked, but is an essential part, I think, uh, of a successful program. At least, certainly, has been for us. Yeah, no, I mean, again, it it happens. However, it happens. It happens. Like you said, it may just be a little bit different than what we traditionally throw it in the post, make back to the basket moves. But it's still, again, we call them quick ups. We call them twenty one position, like dunker spot decisions or roll decisions, <laughs> different things like that. It's just it's the same concept, and it's the same concept for more than just traditionally post players as well. Um, you know, you saw that in the NBA playoffs with uh, certain teams putting what would be categorized as a guard in the dunker spot. You know, it's just right. where can you put someone in an advantage? And that's really what it comes back yeah, to. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Coach, I mean, wrapping up this topic a little bit, uh, you know, we talked about keeping it simple. We talked about do things right. And, and one of the big areas that it comes back to is, is just big myth in coaching that when you prepare for the big game, that it becomes this completely out of body experience, something that, you know, you go, you do all these special things that prepare you for the big game. But what in reality happens when you prepare for the Ivy league championship or the big game that's going to qualify you for the NCAA tournament? Is it, is it something special? Is it something unique or is it accumulation of everything you've done all year? Well, we try to keep the focus on, on the fundamentals, you know, a lot of times in the big game, and you know, we've been fortunate enough to play in some big time environments uh, at Carolina this year, and we did play in the Ivy. You know, we ended up winning the Ivy League regular season championship and playing in the Ivy League tournament final. And w- we try to really keep it to the fundamental things and to the you know basic principles. You know, in terms of how we want to play and what we want to do, and to not get distracted by the bright lights or to not think that well, in order to, to win this one, I got to be different. That, that's, you know, one of the things that, that we feel like players make that mistake sometimes of, well, you know, I know that got me here, but in order to get there, I got to be different. Uh, and I think that's where you tend to get into trouble versus doing what you do, uh, having the belief, having the confidence, and just kind of trying to execute and focus on the fundamentals rather than putting in three new plays like let's just really be sharp with our passing let's just really be you know tight with the ball let's go after everything with two hands you know whatever your you know basic principles are and fundamental things that you care deeply about keep the focus on those things and not so much on well in order to beat those guys we got to reinvent the wheel Uh, i think that that's when you know teams tend to get into trouble well it's great and i think there's sometimes a pressure on coaches to make this like especially if, you know, it's all access and somebody's in there. we got to make this this big moment that's like super special and all that. But I mean, really, again, like you simple, simple applies all year. I mean, it's, it's what got you there. It's who you are. Then simple is part of that. So 
Coach, in saying all this, I mean, uh, you know, I think there's this also, also this other part, which I, I love that you made this point that too simple is not good either, right? Like we can't we can't yes. just be too simple. And I remember this. My eighth grade coach ran a simple play. It was just continuous. He actually called it peanut butter because we'd always remember it. And it was literally this <laughs> dribble at the trail. Trail would just loop loop through, and you just attack the basket and get a layup. And it worked at eighth grade level back twenty years ago. And I'm like, okay. Right. I remember thinking at that time too, we're going to run into a team at some point that takes us away. And they did. We did right. we didn't have a championship because we weren't prepared for something else. So too simple is not good either. Absolutely. And, and that's the, again, the Goldilocks thing of like, you know, too simple, not good, overly complex, also not good and trying to find what's just right, you know, and, and I would say there are certain things that you can reasonably expect to come up throughout the year. So for example, because you just, you know, mentioned that play. If your entire offense is predicated on being able to enter the ball uh, on a pass to the wing and you can't run your offense if that pass gets denied, that's not that's not a good sign because then somebody's going to do that and your team is not going to be prepared for it. And so giving your guys the tools uh I think is really important uh and the reads specific to the offensive end uh, so that they don't just freeze because then that's, I think you said skill equals confidence. That's when guys, if, if you don't give them the, the proper skills and, you know, kind of training and putting them in a position to be successful, then that's when guys will lose confidence. Um, but yeah, so that, that is, that is the challenge for sure. Uh, and then the other, you know, distinction, I know you and I talked about this, uh, as well. Um, like the simple versus complicated and mixing that up with easy versus hard. Uh, you know, simple can be really hard and complicated can be really easy. You know, you can just put in 200 plays and it's really not that hard to do it. You know, you could go, like you said, on Twitter or Instagram and find 200 plays and put them in and not really work so hard. Or you can say, you know what, I'm only putting in five things this year and sift through a thousand to get to five. And that's going to be really hard work in order to simplify, but that may end up being the best thing for you and your team. Totally. Totally. And coach, a great way, a great way to end it. And again, the overriding message is do simple better, right? It's, it's just one of those simple phrases that I love that you shared with us. And, uh, you know, I, ho- I hope coaches, um, reflect upon this. Um, and I guess just, just consider how much, simple can help your team uh, because I know again, in this day and age, there's just so many things going on. So uh, coach, uh, where can people follow you and find you uh, online to be able to share with you as well? Some of their insights as they listen to this. You know what? I actually prepared uh, for a lot of your questions, but I didn't prepare for that one. I don't think I even know uh, my own Twitter handle. Uh, That's I awesome. am on Twitter. I, I really don't. I, it's got, it's my name, but there's, I think an underscore in there. So, just look up <laughs> Mike Sotsky, and I'm sure you can find me. Uh, well, Mike, well, let's, don't worry. We'll take we'll we'll take that one out. But it doesn't matter. We're okay, part of that. Uh, That's cool. Um, but, so no, I'll but, just but and then my email is also uh, on our website. It's uh, you know you can find it on, on the Harvard basketball website. And for anyone who knows Chris, you know, feel free to just get my contact information. And I love talking and, and sharing the game and um, you know learning. So uh, happy to help in any way that I can. Well, that's great. Thanks for taking the time, Coach, and uh, tremendous uh, as we move forward to be able to follow your career as well. And uh, I continue to look forward to learning from you as we have many more conversations over the years. And uh, again, appreciate you taking the time. Likewise. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for listening to the podcast, Coach. I want to share with you something I'm so happy to finally be opening up. It's our basketball immersion training or BI training We were doing a live five-day training camp specifically for college and pro players. It's taking place in my new hometown of Palm Desert, California, and the closest airport is PSP or Palm Springs Airport. This location is just two hours from LAX and is a beautiful spot to learn a game's approach and to improve decision making. I've had many coaches ask me over and over how to develop players and train decision making in the offseason. Well, here it is, a five-day player development academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th, 2019. I'm running this basketball immersion training for your players to attend and learn through eight on-court sessions, three video sessions, 
and group training practices like you've never seen before. You know my love for random practice and transferring skills to games, and these training sessions will be run with a player development focus. This is a full week of me teaching players to be their own coach and to make your life even easier. Come learn for yourself how to best teach your players to make better decisions through group off-season decision training. Send this link to your players ASAP, www.basketballimmersion.com slash BI training. Come join me for a five-day player development academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th, 2019. Hurry, spots are limited. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.